All right, we're recording. OK, great. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jessica Dill, and I work in the research department at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. I'm also the past president of a local nonprofit organization called the Atlanta Economics Club, and I'm a member of the National Association for Business Economics. And um, I'm telling you that because that's why I'm here today. Um, we're here today because the Atlanta Fed, the Atlanta Economics Club, and um, the National Association for Business Economics would like to do more to build the pipeline of future economics professionals. While we know that the study of economics has vast applications and can lead to rewarding careers in the public and private sector um, and across a wide variety of industries, we want to make sure that current undergraduate students know this as well. And that's why we've partnered with local student econ clubs um, at Atlanta area colleges and universities. We're calling this partnership ECOI. Um, it's descriptive, not witty, so it's it stands for the Econ Collaborative of Atlanta Area Academic Institutions. Our collaborative currently has representation from six institutions, the Georgia Gwinnett College, who is the host for our event today, Oglethorpe University, Georgia Tech, Spelman College, Georgia State University, and Morehouse College. And we'll be working to add more Econ programs to the collaborative as the year progresses. So we've joined forces to organize a year long campaign of virtual events, events that are free and open to anyone who's interested. And in these events, we'll highlight the value of a, of a degree or specialization in the field of econ. We'll spotlight possible career paths. We'll discuss steps that recent grads and seasoned professionals have taken to make it where they are today. And we'll showcase how econ backgrounds are being used to make a difference in the world by helping to move the needle on things like sus sus la, sustainability and equity. We're really glad to have you with us. Um, I'm going to drop a link for a sign-in sheet into the chat, so be sure to fill that out. That's how we'll circulate information about future events, um, which we have planned on October 1st and October 26th, and we'll also be sharing the attendance list with a handful of local professors who are offering extra credit in um, exchange for attendance. So to get that credit, um, you'll need to sign in using the, the sign-in sheet in the chat. Um, so with that introduction, I'll go ahead and turn things over to my Atlanta Fed colleague and the moderator for today's event, Megan Houck. Megan, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Jessica, for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, so we'll just go ahead and dive right in here. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists and ask them to sort of bring us up to speed on um, their backgrounds and how they ended up in their current role. So I'm just going to go um, around the screen the way that I see you. So we'll start with Daniel. Daniel, what is your background and how did you end up where you are today? Thank you, Megan. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Once again, my name is Daniel Buitrago. I um, currently work as an economic analyst for Southern Company, which is the holding company for Georgia Power. Many of you probably pay your bills through Georgia Power, so Southern Company is the umbrella uh, over Georgia Power and a couple of other operating companies. Um, I studied economics at Georgia State University on the business school, uh, only had my undergrad and then ultimately was hired as an intern for Southern Company. Thankfully, got turned into a full time position and have been there for three years now. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, now I'll turn it over to my colleague at the Fed, Neil Desai, and ask you the same question. What is your background and how did you end up in your current role? Great. Thanks, Megan, and good evening to, to everybody. Um, make sure you get that extra credit. That's probably the main reason why you are here. Um, so uh, I, I work at the Fed, as Megan said, and uh, I'm in the supervision and regulation division. Um, basically, we supervise banks and make sure they don't do the kinds of shady things that they did back in 2008. So that's kind of what uh, what I'm, I participate in. Um, when I started college back in 2005, uh, I actually had dreams of uh, becoming a doctor, and so I'd enrolled in pre-med. Uh, at the same time, I was doing uh, economics as kind of a, a minor. Uh, very quickly, I realized that uh, my aptitude was not suited to uh, to medicine, and so I decided to lean in a little bit more on the, the econ side, uh, given kind of my tendencies towards math and uh, analytics. So ended up getting a, a, a major in econ, uh, graduated in 2009. Of course, in 2009, we were in the middle of a pretty big recession. And so it provided uh, kind of that slight nudge I needed to go ahead and just uh, enroll in a master's program. 
uh, to kind of delay the clock, if you will, on the on the job market. Um, so I did my master's, graduated uh, at the end of uh, 2010, and then joined the Fed in the research department, which is where Megan and Jessica are, uh, in 2011. Uh, I did the research analyst role at the Fed for three years, which was fantastic. Uh, and then after that, I moved to supervision and regulation because um, the things that I picked up in research, turns out I could apply them in supervision and regulation for stress testing. And, and so that's how I ended up where I am. And I've been in this division for seven years now. Great. Thanks, Neil. Um, moving to Kayla, same question. What is your background and how did you end up in your current role or area of study? Thanks, Megan, and I'm happy to be here today. Um, again, my name is Kayla Reynolds, and I work as an economic and industry insights manager at Cox Automotive. I received my bachelor's from Middle Tennessee State University, and unlike everybody else, that was in marketing. Um, and then I went back to school and received my master's in marketing research. Um, and then I began working at Cox Automotive on the research and market intelligence team on the economic and industry insights team. So that was what qualified me to be able to join the team at Cox Automotive. And recently we've moved under the strategy and corporate development umbrella. So I've been on the team now for around three years. So I really enjoyed it. Great, thanks Kayla. And last but certainly not least, Celine, um, fill us in on what your background is and how you ended up uh, in your current area. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, so I um, went to Georgia Tech undergrad, graduated in 2016. Um, similarly to um, Neil, I also kind of was like, okay, I want to get my, I want to go into pre, um, pre law and be a lawyer. And I was like, okay, economics is the best major for this because it's very broad and it will help me just ace the LSATs. And so I decided to go into it without kind of like a clear mindset. Um, and then quickly I realized I don't want to be stuck in a law library the rest of my life. Um, and I'm much more of a fan of on the ground field work and helping people um, and just kind of economic and equitable economic development. Um, and so I continued majoring in economics, but I also picked up a minor in sustainable cities at Georgia Tech. Um, and that's kind of the closest thing they have to a city planning type minor. Um, unfortunately, they have a really, really great city planning. Um, well, they have a really great city planning um, master's program, but they don't have an undergrad program. So that was kind of my my backup there. Um, and I did a year in Paris on exchange, um, and that kind of opened my eyes up to kind of just the new ways that you can use economics. So I, I did kind of like a certificate in social economics, um, and so I did a lot of field work working with refugees. Um, from middle the Middle East and from Northern Africa in Paris. Um, and so I kind of was investigating how to create more economic opportunities for just all people and kind of establish a pipeline of those opportunities and communities. Um, and so once coming back to the US, I was like, okay, what now? Because <laughs> um, I knew I didn't want to go to law school. I knew I was interested in economics and I was fascinated by it, but I kind of wanted to use it in a different way. Um, and I had always been really, really interested in cities. And so um, I kind of started looking at city planning type jobs and then a lot of them required a master's degree. I also realized I hadn't really gotten too, too much of that city planning knowledge yet. Um, and I kind of wanted to expand and look at urban design and, and kind of the nitty gritty start parts of city planning. And so I applied to city planning programs, including Georgia Tech. Um, and um, ended up at UPenn. And so that's where I am right now, my second and final year, um, getting a master's in city planning with a focus on urban design. So I'm currently in Philly, not in Atlanta. Wow, that's super interesting. So yeah, we've got some, some varying backgrounds here, a couple panelists who sort of fell into economics and um, one panelist, Kayla, that that doesn't have an economics background degree per se, um, but is now has has stepped into the economics world professionally. Um, so that's kind of what we're here to talk about: is what an what an econ degree can do, or where econ profession professions can take you um, in in the sort of professional world. 
Um, so I'm gonna dive into some targeted questions. I'm gonna start with Neil, um, just because that's what, who's top of my list right now. And I'm gonna ask you, how do you interact with economics in your day-to-day -day job? Yeah, sure, Megan. And I'll kind of zoom out a, a little bit and just talk a bit about what parts of econ I find to be the most valuable in, in my career. So if I had to summarize economics in one word, a word other than economics, uh, I would probably use the word optimization. So economics, most of what you learn, most of what you study centers on this concept of optimizing whatever decision you have to make. Um, economics gives you a kind of a, a fantastic framework for how to think about optimization. Macroeconomics gives you a framework for optimizing, you know, the, the economy. Microeconomics gives you a framework for data analysis that can help you optimize, you know, pricing, for example, at a company. Um, but really this framework, particularly the framework that econometrics provides you, which is kind of the data analysis branch of economics, is transferable to any industry. So economics essentially gives you a skill set that you can apply to any industry that you want to participate in, because at the end of the day, all companies need to optimize certain parts of their of their business. Um, and so the, the way I interact with economics on a day to day basis is when I was in the research uh, division at the Fed, uh, I you know, worked with economists who were doing research and uh, they were creating these econometric models to get at relationships between different factors, you know, in their area of study. The area that uh, I was involved in was uh, mortgage markets. Um, and so I was doing, you know, hands-on coding, hands-on data analysis, creating regression models. Um, and <clears throat> econometrics was, of course, kind of the foundation of all of the different techniques that, that I was using. Um, and that really kind of strengthened that analytical approach that I had already learned in, in college. Um, switching over to supervision and regulation, uh, the way I interact with economics is kind of very different now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, all companies need to optimize their decisions and all companies includes banks. So if you think about Bank of America, Wells Fargo, these giant companies also have to optimize their decision making. And to optimize these decisions, they use statistical models. Um, and these models are steeped in theory and they're steeped in, uh, in, of course, data analysis. And in my role in supervision and regulation, I go to these banks and I make sure that they're applying these models in a safe and sound manner, that they are managing you know, the assumptions related to these models appropriately, that they're using the model outcomes appropriately, that the model design makes sense, uh, and, and things of that nature. So instead of doing, now I'm more overseeing and challenging. That's kind of my, my role. But the things that I learned, you know, the, everything starts with first principles and the things that I learned in econ in college and the things that I learned using econometrics in my research position, um, they have really provided me with a fantastic foundation you know, just question banks on their risk management. And in general, it's actually just kind of trained me to question anything that people have to say. Like in, in today's world, you know, there's a lot of misinformation going on. It just kind of gives you that critical thinking mindset where, okay, wh what is the underlying assumption behind a claim that someone is making? When you read a statistic on Reddit, immediately my mind goes to, okay, well, how did they come up with that? What are the underlying assumptions? And economics really kind of kind of trained me to do that. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great, those are really important points. I think it's good to point out, um, obviously everyone wants to optimize what they're doing in their day to day. Um, and just that, like you said, that real world critical thinking is super important um, for, for everyone everywhere. Um, and it, it, that's a great transition to come to Kayla, um, who is at Cox Automotive. Um, and I wanted to ask how you see your major translating into the position that you're in, which is very economics focused, and how maybe other majors might translate to that as well. I think Neil gave the perfect segue into this as well, where my master's in marketing research allowed me to gain a lot of the critical thinking skills needed 
to be hands on in the economic field. So, you know, he was speaking about modeling and regression modeling, like with statistical and data analysis. Once you're using tools such as SPSS and whatnot, you're able to translate that into other fields or other majors such as economics. So that gave me the ability to have rigor when I'm doing the data analysis. So I didn't understand it when they hired me. And I think a lot of people didn't understand it either because the furthest I went into economics was taking the micro and macro economics in business school. And so once I joined the team and I realized that a lot of the data analysis and the processes that they were using were very similar to marketing research and statistical analysis, it was very transferable regarding those skills and allowed for me to be successful in what I was doing and also, you know, stand out in other ways, whereas, you know, I'm able to do A-B testing and I'm able to understand survey analysis, which also is heavy in the economics field as well. So I saw that a lot of things, I feel like the foundation is always to be curious and to ask those questions, and that will always be transferable in economics because it's an ever-evolving and a trending world, and as long as you have that view and as long as you have those analysis skills, I feel like it will transfer into any economics position. I totally agree. Um, and, and that is an excellent segue to my next question for Celine, um, which is with your um, undergrad in econ and then your master's in planning, correct? Um, where do you see where do you see your post graduation self, and how are you going to apply your undergrad econ degree into that into the rest of that? Yeah, that's the million dollar question right there. Um, <laughs> so right now, um, I have always been passionate about traveling and just living in different countries, experiencing different cultures, um, and so I actually applied for a Fulbright fellowship in China. Um, slash Singapore, um, and it's specific for urban planning, um, but the award is specific also for looking at sustainable innovations. Um, and so my proposal is looking at how to create social and also economic opportunities for artisans in Singapore, because they actually outsource most of their um, most of their labor to other places um, in Southeast Asia, um, and so. If you kind of asked me four years ago, would I be doing this? I would have said absolutely not. <laughs> um, but like I said, my passion really is is rooted in kind of providing economic opportunities and pipelines for marginalized communities, especially black and brown communities. And this is kind of a way to kind of test that um, and also to support um, an artisan community, which is something I'm really passionate about as well, um, since I have an art background. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's one idea that I have right now. Um, another option might be just staying in Philly or New York um, and working for a community and economic development firm called Urbane. Um, and they are black owned and focused on equitable development as well. Um, that also is kind of attached with real estate place based investment. Um, and so that actually uses a lot of um, analytic skills that I use in economics as well. Um, so we create like performas and how to estimate um, what the cost and return on investment would be for different real estate pro um, properties in different areas in New York and Philly. Um, so that's a long winded answer to a <laughs> few options that I'm looking at right now. But yeah, check in in the three months. Maybe I'll have a better solid answer. <laughs> we'll definitely do that. But I think, I mean, you really illustrate how um, sort of an economics basis is transferable to a lot of different places. And I think the the global aspect of it as well, where where we're really in a global economy and um, to be able to take those skills all over the world is important. So um, my next question is for Daniel. So Daniel, how did you find um, the job search process post graduation? And what expectations did you have about the field um, that you went into and has anything surprised you? Sure. Thank you, Megan. Uh, well, while I was at Georgia State University, I originally actually didn't, I think, know what I wanted to do, like many of us probably on the call, um, so don't be scared. Uh, I actually, my first couple internships were more sales oriented, uh, account manager type of uh, role that would pop up right after college, more of a marketing role. 
but I knew that I wanted to touch up on my analytical skills. So that's where, and since high school, I always thought since the econ class I took in high school, I thought econ was really interesting and really cool. Uh, but never really thought about it as a as a major because I didn't think my math and analytical skill set was up to par to what was needed. Uh, but around halfway through college, I decided to go through the business side of of economics, which wasn't as extensive on the math and statistical side as as the uh, uh, science of piece where you had to take more econometrics and, and more of those classes. Um, so I decided to go that path with with the goal of building up my analytical skills, but also saw that there was some presentation side of of that major that I enjoyed, uh, which is what I had truly wanted to do is more face to face interaction, more client face interaction. Um, luckily, while I was doing uh, while I was in my third and fourth year of college, I saw a, a job posting at Georgia State where they were looking for an economic analyst intern, intern which you know, looking at the description, it basically fit what I was looking for. I was uh, working for a uh, energy company that was seeking an intern to learn about the energy field, uh, use you know whatever econ knowledge they already had through through college to help uh, do some research and ultimately do some presentations uh, within the group of the forecasters at Southern Company. Um, so that was sort of my process of in college and then to getting a job, which at the time I didn't know it was going to be a full time job, which uh, I guess one advice to, to everybody, even no matter how you feel in the internship you're in or you will be, uh, whether you're one week, one month, two months into the process, you never know what that's going to turn into. So I think it's always good to have an open mindset and a positive mindset uh, and give it a little bit of time if, if it takes a little bit more time to, to warm up because it could lead to a full time job and potentially could lead to, to your whole career. Um, now, what expectations that I have about the field and, and what surprised me? Again, kind of going back to my first point on economics, I, I expected it uh, uh, for me not to really fit the criteria because I I don't think I was, I was born with that statistical math gene, uh, but I did see that there was a skill set needed in that field, whereas you're, you're talking about, you're, you're telling the story of whatever economic research, economic analysis that is presented, you need somebody needs to tell that story to an audience that is not necessarily uh, well read or has an econ major, and that's going to be a lot, a lot of a lot of my day to day at work at Southern Company is tailored to those type of audience. I'm talking to um, you know, all sorts of groups across the company, whether they're engineers, whether they're in the sales field. Um, of their forecasters, so it, it ranges on audience that are more are, are more well read or, or or more attached to econ in their work, and some that don't need it at all. But ultimately, what I've come to to see and, and you know motivates me that that I I think I chose the right field is that it seems to be a necessity more and more more often than not across various groups in my company. And from what I've talked to my peers, it's it's something that is. Uh, uh, seen across different sectors. Um, most of my day to day or month to month is tied to our forecasting groups, uh, helping them with uh, with their modeling of energy. So we forecast energy sales for the southern states in the US uh, and I help them provide some knowledge based on some of the research and reporting I do on the economic analysis of how Georgia is performing, how the labor market's doing, how the housing market's doing and so forth. And also at the macro scale at the US level as well. Um, but also I've, as the time has gone by, I've been exposed to a lot of uh, sides of the business thanks to having that um, maybe subject level expertise of economics where there's a lot of teams that are seeking maybe an answer that they haven't already gotten. And, and there's not that many people that do what I do at my company, which is 30,000 people strong. Uh, so it allows you to get exposed uh, and potentially uh, me being early on in my career of three years could lead you to another position where maybe it's not as specific to economics, but you can use the econ knowledge and the econ expertise that you've learned uh, through college, uh, through your uh, master's program or PhD program, or just like myself, who just has an undergrad and has uh, figured out and learned most of the econ knowledge uh, through work uh, and use that you know, for the next step, whether it's more of a uh, sales oriented role, uh, which I'm still interested in, or if it's still focused more on analytical. And I think 
econ is is is, is a great background to have uh, i think really for for a lot of fields out there so uh hopefully this resonates with some some of you out there that maybe are not too focused on econ but are interested in it uh my advice to you will be it's if you are interested in it it's it's worth uh i think reaching and, and trying it because at the end of the day no matter what job you do if you have a strong analytical background it's going to make your job a lot easier no matter what you do um so yeah that's all i got those are really great points daniel i appreciate it thank you um megan i'll just i'll just add on to uh what daniel said uh the the, the communication aspect that daniel mentioned i cannot emphasize enough how important that is in whatever role you have. Like, if you are capable of understanding complex analytical topics and then translating them to, for an audience who is not in the same field or not at that same level, you will be loved by all your colleagues, all your uh, you know peers, the audience, and your manager. Everybody will love you because. Everybody needs that kind of uh, bridge maker, I'll call it, where you got to kind of close the gap. So I think econ provides you with uh, kind of the analytical uh, tools you need. Um, even if you're not so deep in the math, it still provides you with an analytical uh, framework of thinking where you can become a strong communicator and bridge that gap between uh, different audiences. Very important. Yeah, great point, Neil. And and like Daniel said, speaking to different, being able to speak to different audiences at different levels is super important and and something that comes from that that econ knowledge as well. Um, <clears throat> and I know so, Daniel, you were talking a little bit about and and Caleb both have talked about what you do sort of in the corporate environment. Do you think that um, the corporate environment and I'll toss this to to either one who wants to answer. Um, sort of views economics differently than the research in, environment. Kayla, if you're ready, I'll, I'll let you have it. Okay, I'll start um, as the non-econ person. Um, but I will say that in the corporate environment, what I find, especially when we're a team of seven in in Cox Enterprises, is like Daniel said, probably about 20,000 employees strong. We are on the automotive end. But I find that people view our team, the economics team, as a more cause and effect type team. They look to us when things are happening in the industry, um, in the economy, and overall holistically. And they're wanting us to see, you know, this is the cause and what's going to happen to the industry overall. And so we're more as the industry subject matter experts in understanding what's gonna happen in the future and understanding how this is gonna impact either the business as a whole or even the nation or even a global impact to the industry. So for automotive, obviously we know the best example is we're having this microchip shortage. Um, and then when we when COVID-19 hit, we were a team of seven, but we're small and very mighty, but we were looked to by the whole company to understand what's going to happen in the market and how is this not only gonna impact Cox Automotive, but how is this going to impact the automotive industry going from wholesale to new to used? So I see in the corporate environment, that's definitely the best understanding of how economics is viewed. It's more of like industry insights and, and understanding the industry and understanding if you pull this lever, what's going to happen in the industry. So I'll say that from the corporate side, I feel like that's how economics is definitely viewed. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add. I think uh, I agree completely with Kayla and have experienced the same uh, throughout my my early career. Uh, I think the way she put it of cost and effect, that's uh, how I mostly feel about most of my most of my uh, uh, duties or, or ad hoc requests that I get. Specifically over this past year and a half with COVID and, and, and the pandemic, there's been you know way more demand from teams that I hadn't met or hadn't heard of before where they're seeking uh, a story or uh, you know, some sort of explanation as to why X, Y, and Z is happening in their side of the business within the energy sector. Um, so I think, as Kayla said, it, at least in my job, is uh, we're so, sort of facilitators or as an internal consultant in a way of trying to help solve problems with the research that we do or our teams do uh, and the, the background and knowledge that we have in economics. Uh, and maybe it doesn't solve the issue or, or gives you the answer, but at least it could guide you in the right trajectory where you know it, it will help you make better decisions moving forward. 
Yeah, we need those um, economics crystal balls, right? We got to we gotta get you guys to see into the future for us using that backward looking data. <laughs> so, um, okay, well, I think we have about 10 minutes left before audience Q&A. So I just want to do a quick go around and find out what each of you um, wish you would have known as an undergrad. So share a little bit of knowledge with our undergrads on here. Um, I will just start with Kayla. I will start. So what I wish I would have known, especially as a woman of color and going into a more rigorous world, is definitely not having imposter syndrome in the industry. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that impacted me in the beginning. That was the reason I chose marketing as my undergrad. Um, was just because I felt as though I could not fulfill the needed responsibilities for a more rigorous position. Um, I was asked, I got, I had flying colors in both of my economics classes, and I also had flying colors in my accounting classes. And both of those businesses asked me to transfer over, but it was more of imposter syndrome for why I did not. Um, and then when I graduated and I figured out that the line of work that I was doing wasn't challenging enough, that's what pushed me into marketing research because it had the ability, I was kind of straddling the line between applied mathematics and also social sciences. And it was very, I'm sorry, that's my daughter in the background if you guys hear, but it was very challenging, of course, in that aspect. And so that's my biggest advice is don't have imposter syndrome, especially in the corporate world. You're gonna have internal and external clients who are gonna be looking to you for subject matter, as a subject matter expert. And you know what you're talking about and you understand and you know the environment. So don't question yourself. Um, you're in this field for a reason. And of course, you're here for a reason. You're joining our meeting for a reason. Um, so I just encourage you to be confident in your abilities, especially going into the um, job field when you graduate. Really, really great advice, Kayla. Um, I will move to Celine next. What do you wish you knew as an undergrad? Yeah, so. Um... I would say just don't be afraid to try new things. And this is like very stereotypical, but follow your passions. Um, I feel like now, unfortunately, a lot of people, I see this, um, especially even in college, I saw this, people were focused on what they are already good at and not what they can be good at. Um, and I think there's a difference between like passions and, and what you your natural ability is. You don't wake up just being passionate about piano you kind of listen to piano and like dabble and then you get passionate about it and I think exploring those is so incredibly valuable um and even applying your passions to economics um where however that may be is just so important um and that's kind of how I got to where I am and I'm extremely really really proud I was able to do that but I kind of wish I knew that freshman year and started doing that even in high school um so I, I, I hadn't wasted as much time. Um, so yeah, just try, write down what you're passionate about and then see where the gaps are or even how it's connected to economics or even what you may want to do um, and just try them out because you guys are so young <laughs> and you have time to mess up um, and try new things. And that's the beauty of, of being in school. So. Yeah, I really like that point about talent versus just hard work. You really, you have to have something you're interested in, but you don't necessarily have to be good at it right off the bat, which kind of goes back to an imposter syndrome a little bit as well. Um, so I will move to Neil now. Neil, what do you wish you had known as an undergrad? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, number one is, uh, do what you want to do, not what uh, not what other people think you should do. And as an example, you know, when I decided that pre-med was not for me, pretty much everybody kind of pushed me in the direction of like, hey, you should do accounting. And from a probability perspective, sure, I mean, the likelihood of uh, of getting a decent job was actually pretty good if I had done accounting. But I knew that I couldn't wrap my head around accounting. Like it was just not for me. And I probably would have jumped off a bridge if I had to do it. And that's just me. I'm just speaking for myself. My wife is an accountant and she's upstairs listening to me right now. And she knows how I feel. So <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so everybody was trying to get me to do accounting. And I said, well, this is just, I'll be miserable if I do this. And so I did economics instead. And 
you know, it, 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 it worked out for me, but I think it's just a little anecdote to say, you know, people might be telling you what you should do, but go with what you feel like is the right thing for you. Um, the second thing, if you find out that economics is the right thing for you, then um, things worked out for me through sheer dumb luck in the sense that the skills that I needed, I really picked up uh, during my master's course. But as an undergrad, what I wish I knew was, you know, don't ignore econometrics. Econometrics provides you with a really, when I say econometrics, I'm talking about like things like regression analysis and associated inference. Um, what it gives you is a skill set and a foundation in data analytics that you can apply at literally any company you choose to work at. Uh, and so for me, econometrics is probably one of the most powerful components of economics. Now you might hear it referred to as data science or something else. It's all kind of the in the in the same uh, playpen. Um, but as an undergrad, I, I wish I had known just how important this was going to be. Um, so that, you know, when I enrolled in my master's and when I started working, I would have leaned in like even even more. Turns out I picked up the skills I needed during my master's course. Um, but anyway, don't ignore econometrics. <laughs> I think that's an important lesson and um, you know that that literacy can help you in so many other areas as well just understanding statistics or um, you know speaking of the global pandemic understanding all of the studies that's that are going on with that um, having that econom econometrics basis really clarifies that at least for me so um, and last but not least, Daniel, um, to share with us what you wish you'd known as an undergrad. Thanks, Megan. Uh, one of the, I guess the main thing that pops up is not that I wish I'd known because I, I knew how important it was, but I guess I didn't practice it as much, um, is reading, really. Uh, I think you know, it sounds pretty basic and simple, but a lot of us don't do enough of it. And it, not necessarily just reading, if you're not too much of a reader and you're more of a podcast listener or you're a visual person, you maybe more of a video webinar or, uh, you know, some credible YouTube videos out there. I think just staying up to date in current events and using your curiosity that you probably already have being a student and also being in an e-com program. I think we all share that curiosity of trying to use the, the theories that we've learned through economics to try to figure out issues. Um, so I would say that that's that's a big one that still I think I'm trying to work with uh, or trying to work on on my end. Um, I try to, to read a lot in the mornings. It helps me stay up to date on current events. It helps me uh, talk about uh, whether it's uh, uh, a recent economic series that was updated, whether it's your GDP or employment, little things like that is good to have in the back of your head as back pocket items, specifically if you're in the econ field. But not necessarily if you're in that other fields too, because that's usually uh, you know conversation, a small talk at the office, or right now virtually. Um, reading is a big one. Stay, stay up to date in current events. And another one, kind of to to uh, to conclude this portion, would be asking questions. Uh, you know, one of one of the themes we had here is that don't be afraid. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. I think I I still work with I still work on trying to be better at that. Um, you're not going to learn as much into your first job unless you're asking those questions and don't be scared of their silly ones in your head or very simple. A lot of the times when people have already done a job for more than six months or a year, they you know, feel like a lot of what they do is already pretty simple. So they may talk in acronyms, for example, when you join a company. And if you don't ask simple questions like what's that acronym, you're not going to know the full content of the conversation. So. Uh, definitely read, stay up to date on current events, and don't be afraid to ask questions, no matter how silly or, or or dumb you think they may be. I think it's it's a it's a good process for you to learn more and also for you to get out of your comfort zone uh, on a daily basis. Those are great points, Daniel, and and those questions can also help you build those relationships within within your company and without. So. Um, Great, thank you all for that. So I think we can move to the Q&A now. Let me check the chat. I think I maybe saw some questions come through, but I'm not sure. Um, or we can open it up. Uh, if anybody has any questions they'd like to put in the chat. Jessica, do you see any? 
Megan, there was a comment about politics, and I think uh, Celine also made a comment about public policy. And so maybe um, we don't, I don't think we have any politicians um, amongst the panelists, but uh, Celine, do you want to, um, do you want to share your comment about public policy and, and maybe expand on your thoughts uh, for the comment you dropped in the chat? Yeah, so I guess my, my mindset kind of going into that question was that data is just really applied everywhere now. Um, when I went to city planning to get my master's, or I, I'm in my master's right now, I honestly didn't expect to be doing a lot of data wrangling, um, but literally in every single course in every single assignment, our first thing that we do is assessing the neighborhood based on the secondary data before we jump into looking at the primary data. And so the secondary data would be looking at race, you know, age, income of the community, um, rent rates, ownership rates, et cetera. Um, and so that will inform kind of how we do our primary research. Um, and so regarding politics, actually, um, we haven't touched too much on politics, honestly. Well, every discussion ha involves politics with city planning. <laughs> um, but uh, we I haven't done too, too much um, political analysis as much per se. Um, but a lot of the issues kind of are rooted in the politics of the US. Um, for instance, we do a lot of um, analysis on incarceration rates um, and kind of segmenting that by race and gender, um, state, even city, um, and looking at kind of what the lot the commonalities are. And we kind of use it also to tell a story as well. Um, and so I would say um, regarding politics, I think you definitely can analyze a lot of it. Um, I'm trying to think of, I don't know if anyone else has any other resources that they can think of or um, databases that might be focused more on politics. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but. Yeah, Celine, I'll just add uh, Nate Silver's blog, uh, 538.com. I think it's 538.com. Uh, anyway, Nate Silver is basically like a statistician slash economist, and he uses the tools that economists use to analyze politics. Um, now, it's not, you know, it, it's not the issues that Celine mentioned, um, like incarceration, although they do have some one offs on that stuff, too. But it's a free blog, 538.com. Uh, check it out, and it can show you how the skill set that you might pick up in economics, you can apply it to literally any domain, and in this case, it would be politics. And I think I would just add that um, economics and politics are, are very intertwined. I mean, you're not you're not going to meet a politician that it doesn't talk about the economy in some some way, shape or form, whether it's, you know, how immigrants affect that um, stimulus. I mean, there's just it's it's very much intertwined. So um, understanding the economy is really going to help you um, understand a lot about politics as well. Kayla, I, Dan oh, go ahead. I would add to that and also say vice versa. Understanding politics will help you understand the economy as well. Being new to economics, but kind of understanding politics just from a that has also helped a lot in my role with doing analysis where people are asking, you know, how how is Biden's, you know, new bill towards wanting to be fully or 50 percent electric electric on the vehicle side? How is that going to impact the industry? But also, how is that going to impact, you know, state regulations? How is that also going to impact the incentives and the tax um, incentives that states are offering for people when they're buying electric vehicles? So. I will also say that like in any aspect or any economic role, you'll see that it's just hand in hand um, and back to cause and effect. You know, when things happen in politics, normally things happen in the economy as well. Yeah, and Kayla, I'll just add that people lie with numbers all the time. And so what, what economics teaches you is really to question what's behind the number and how people came up with the number and what inference you can draw from the number. So um, I think. Uh, it basically just helps you frame, you know, what the analysis is is telling you. So yes, agreed. Uh, a perfect example would be, unfortunately, I was um, in the CNN fact check, President Biden's fact check for I think something he spoke about for electric vehicles, and it wasn't correct. And so, unfortunately, I was the one quoted in the fact check, but that's showing that you know numbers don't lie, but sometimes politicians 
can. So, you know, numbers don't lie and the economic numbers definitely don't lie. So I will say that it's, like you said, always hand in hand and data is the most important. Can I jump in here? Um, Megan is our um, moderator, but I don't think she introduced herself properly. And I think that, um, so Megan, Megan has an undergraduate degree and then worked for several years and went back to get her master's. And I, I think that that represents a demographic of students that might be on the line, students that may not have gone straight from high school to college, but may have started working and then, and then made a, a decision to go back and pursue a degree, whether it be undergrad or graduate. And so I'd just like to ask Megan, um, maybe to share with us, what inspired you to go back to school and how's that experience been um, for you to get a master's degree in econ? Sure, I'll take a panelist chair briefly. Um, so I uh, three years ago, I started in the research department. I started at the Fed um, in sort of the um, facilities department, event management, and moved into research, which I'd always had an interest in. Um, and when I moved into research, I started sitting in on economic briefings and Kayla you talked about asking questions but it really wasn't appropriate for me to jump in and say what does our star mean um so I just started writing these things down and realizing um sort of the depth of knowledge that I was missing and that's where um I stumbled on a uh fully online program that was that was really easily integrated integrated into my work life and so I was able to continue that somehow through the pandemic and two children trying to Zoom educate them. <laughs> uh, that didn't work well, but um, I was able to keep that going. And so that's kind of where where I ended up. I'm just about to finish my applied economics master's. So, yeah. Were there any more um, questions from the audience? Can can I chime in here one more time? Um, so I know we have several econ professors that have logged in um, for today's event. And so I might put you unexpectedly on the spot and just ask, are, is there anything you'd like to ask the panelists that maybe hasn't been asked that you'd like for them to highlight for the students on the call? Um, maybe something we haven't thought about that but that's an important angle. Um, so we'll give it just a minute, but I, I hope I hope and encourage you to, to chime in because um, I think it's been a great conversation and a lot of great insights shared today. I'll go ahead and ask a question. So um, I am Atsali urman Bietava from the School of Economics at Georgia Tech. Everybody, hi, who is here from Georgia Tech? Uh, Yellow Jackets Rock. <laughs> and um, I have a question for you in terms of networking. So we hear that for, particularly for finance and business majors, networking is very, very important. And um, I think that they have this um, model or the mechanics of networking um, really down, right? In the business schools and the business curriculum. If there is anything that you wish you learned in school um, in terms of networking, the value of networking, how to network would be like one or a couple of pieces of advice that you would love to share with our students. That would be great. And for us too. I'll start. Um, when I, my perfect example is when I started going to Atlanta Economic Club meetings um, in person prior COVID, um, I was very intimidated by the intellect and by the knowledge in the room, but I feel like in especially the economy field, people like to get asked questions and people like to have discussions. And that will be what a lot of these people that could actually get you in rooms and open doors and speak about you in other rooms that you're not in. Once you start those discussions, like they're going to remember that. And once you ask them these questions, they're also going to remember that. So they understand that you're a student and they also understand that you may be new in the job field or in your career, but I feel like economists are always open to help and ask questions and give insight. So just don't be nervous or be timid about asking any questions or asking for help or even asking just for networking or, you know, advice or resources. So that'll be.
Oh no, I think I think Kayla froze on us, but that was that was a great insight about networking. Oh, there you go. You're back. <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about networking? I can chime in. Um, I guess I personally I'm not a fan of networking. I always feel really guilty for doing it because I feel like I it's kind of an extractive thing to do. But kind of to add on to what Kayla was saying, it really is not. Um, if you're talking with the right person and you'll know if you're talking with the right person <laughs> um, because people I mean most people are just really really wanting to help the younger generation and um, even like I I'm only two years out of college and I would love to help anyone in college or even in high school um, and so I would not be too scared to reach out um, even just cold emailing someone who has a really interesting career or um, has the same interest or Maybe you know a family member who has a really cool career, who has a friend who has a really cool career. Just kind of think about who you know, start there, and don't be afraid to kind of um, reach out. And honestly, don't even see it as networking. See it as just kind of meeting a mentor, making a mentor, building a relationship with someone. Um, and it honestly can really help. And it could be even a friendship. Um, I have a lot of really great friendships with my mentors and I don't even see this networking. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll second that. Um, when, when people are networking just for the sake of networking, it becomes very obvious and it seems not authentic at all. And so <laughs> you learn very quickly that those are probably not the, the people, um, you, you know, you're that interested in talking to, but Taking an active interest in someone's journey or having a, a real conversation with someone where you have a shared interest. I think those are the things that can, you know, yield some rewards, not just in terms of opportunities, but just in terms of personal growth as well. So I'm, I'm hopeless at networking. Um, I don't go out there and network for the sake of networking. Maybe I, I should, but I don't. Um, but I do, when I find interesting people, I do go out of my way to have conversations with them because I find it just a personally enriching experience and it ends up maybe helping me professionally, maybe not, but that's almost a secondary thing. Yeah, not too much to add from my end. Um, I, I'm not sure if somebody mentioned it already. Sorry if I repeat myself for, for that, but using your resources at school, whether it's clubs or uh, events that you see going on at school, use that as obviously a platform to go network. I know right now it's a little bit harder uh, with the pandemic, but I do know there is a lot of virtual uh, related networking events out there that your school is probably doing, uh, either through clubs or through events that are going on. So use it as a platform and also uh, use it as, again, getting out of your comfort zone. It, it may be a little bit scary at first, uh, you know, trying to approach somebody, uh, but again, I think at the end of the day, it's 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 a good practice and um, uh, good for you. To, the more you get out of your comfort zone, I think the more comfortable you'll get with other experiences that, that will uh, come later in life. Absolutely. Um, well, we have just a few minutes left. Um, maybe there was one more question. Um, what do you think employers are looking for in job candidates? Is there anything that sort of jumps out like a big thing that um, you think they're looking for? Um, I'll say two things, one on the technical side, one on the behavioral side. Uh, on the technical side, having data analysis skills in this day and age is extremely important um, to, 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 you know, to have a, an interesting job from the get go. Like you can certainly get, get jobs, entry level jobs uh, without data analysis skills and then develop those skills over time. That's an option. But if you develop your data anal analysis skill, and when I say data analysis, I'm talking about programming, regression analysis, um, you know, nowadays machine learning, um, those will give you basically a, a, a pretty solid head start to getting the types of jobs you're eventually want to be interested in. So um, that, that would be my recommendation on the technical side. On the behavioral side, and this is perhaps the most important thing that I can say is, you know, in a job interview, be inquisitive, be humble, and be upfront about what you're good at and what what challenges you may have. Um, you know, during a job interview, it's a it's a two way interview where you want to make sure that the position is right for you, not just that the employer hires you. 
Um, and so it's, it's important to just be authentic in any conversation you have, including an interview conversation, um, and, and treat it more as a conversation rather than like a, a, you know, a police interrogation where the flashlight's on you. Um, I think the, that, you know, interviewers like that, I've interviewed many candidates um, for a couple of different uh, departments at the Fed. And those are kind of the, the main things that, that I look for, just authentic people who are humble, who are nice, who can communicate well, and who come with a, a relatively strong technical background. Okay, great. Well, that's a good note to end on, some good advice. Um, thank you so much to our panelists. We really appreciate you all being here. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended. Hope you have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you Bye. for coming. Thank you for organizing. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thanks.